Hi, everyone. I'm not sure why you're all sitting in the back of the room, but I can, <laughs> and I can see you all. Uh, it's been really nice to be here at the Cinemateca and to collaborate with the staff for a few days on this workshop. Uh, and now I'm going to do this uh, public presentation for you. I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the preservation of audiovisual material, video and film, and how this relates to concepts of uh, open source. Uh, let's see, okay, first I'll introduce myself a little more because I didn't understand all of Henry's introduction of myself. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I studied at a film archive in Rochester, New York, uh, where the Kodak company uh, was, which used to make all the film, or a lot of the film. So this school uh, taught film preservation. So you learned everything about all, all the aspects of uh, preserving film like the chemistry, the mechanics, the optics, uh, projection, duplication, cataloging, inspection. So going through this program, I felt like I understood really how to have a lot of control over all preservation aspects of film. But uh, <clears throat> I didn't know how to do this with uh, digital information or videotape or any other format, just film, only film. So when I got out of school, my first job was with a collection of all uh, digital formats. Um, so, uh, in, in present, so when I meet people who work in audiovisual preservation, uh, often, like there are some people who just start learning film, like deep into the film archives and don't work with so many other formats. The more traditional way to learn about audiovisual formats is that first you learn about film, and then you learn about videotape, and then you learn about digital formats. And it's in kind of a chronological order. Um, <clears throat> for me going, for me, I went from uh, a very intensive film preservation background into working with digital formats, and then in more, my more recent position, work with videotape. Uh, so because of this, a lot of my presentation makes analogies between film preservation and digital preservation. Um, the concept of open source and free software will be throughout my uh, presentation a lot. Um, like as I've learned how to preserve digital information, I've ended up using a lot of uh, open source free software tools like VLC, FFmpeg. Um, using these tools is, is, is good because like we can contribute to them, use them to build other tools, um, and we can transfer our knowledge easily amongst the community uh, because we're talking about how we're using uh, content that's available for free. Uh, so because this concept of free software is a bit foundational to my presentation, I want to talk about the definition of it a little bit. Uh, one of the early definitions of free software refers to these four freedoms. Um, the first one is that you should be able to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Um, often you know if you download an application like iTunes, you get the big contract to say, okay, you can use iTunes, but you can only use it for this purpose and this. You cannot use it for this or this. With free software, it's like, okay, here's the software. However you want to use it, it's okay. Help yourself. Uh, the second one is the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does uh, your computing as you wish. Uh, this requires access to the source code. Uh, so this is, this is a big difference between um, free software and what, proprietary or closed software. Uh, for instance, if I want to see how iTunes works, I cannot really do so. Uh, the source code is not available. I can study its behavior, but I can't really um, read its code. I can't see how it's designed or constructed. Uh, but with, with free software, I can, I can use it, and if it works for my purpose, it's okay. If I'm like, okay, I wish the software would change a bit uh, to accommodate my need, I can study that and I can try to comprehend what the change would be and maybe implement it or pay somebody to implement it. Uh, the third freedom is that you should be able to redistribute the copies so that you can help your neighbor. Um, you know, for instance, if I download a VLC player and it's helpful for me, it's free software, I can give it to someone else or say, download it from here, we, we can share it as we like. Uh, this isn't this isn't true with non-free software because you have to pay. There's a business model. Uh, you have, to, if you are redistributing it uh, without authorization, you are engaging in piracy. But with free software, the redistribution is encouraged. Uh, this is this concept is particularly important in audiovisual preservation because 
trying to preserve film, videotape, digital audiovisual formats is a challenge, and it's a challenge shared by many archives around the world. Uh, it really benefits us to collaborate, uh, to share knowledge, to share our skills um, and our tools. So if we can share our tools with each other, it helps us out enormously. Uh, for instance, if um, like the videotape, archivists would be very dependent on the players, like to have a VHS player or a Umatic or Betacam player in order to access the contents of the videotape. Uh, but with digital formats, we don't need a physical player, we need a software player. Um, with, uh, with the hardware, like a Umatic player or a VHS player, I cannot, can, I cannot do a copy-paste to make another one. But this is a big advantage for us with digital formats because we can uh, copy the, the players as much as we like. And then the last freedom is um, kind of about how open source helps us engage with the community. So this is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. Uh, so if I am using FFmpeg or VLC or another open project and I change it to make it better for me, uh, more helpful in my role as a um, archivist, I can then take my, cha my change and share it with others. So if I, uh, and, and in practice I've done this very often and so have many other archivists. Like we end up, um, you know, using, using FFmpeg, we look at the source code, we say, okay, it needs to add this other format too. Uh, or this other type of uh, verification or function. We add it to the code, it runs for us, it's good, but we want to share the results. With free software, it allows us to share the results. Whereas if I took a copy of like Final Cut Pro and I somehow hack it and change it to do something better for me, Apple would prevent me from sharing that with other people. <coughs> so uh, in coming from a film preservation background uh, and moving into a role as a digital archivist, uh, it made me think about the experience of, of working with film and how it's, it's kind of divided into two very different concepts. Um, when I'm trying to care for a film print, the process of interacting with the film print is very different if it's uh, like on a bench or a table inspecting it with my hands versus seeing the image on the screen. Um, so for instance, I'm showing like a, a PowerPoint presentation right now you can learn a lot about this presentation by seeing the image right here, but you're not actually seeing the, the contents of the file itself. Uh, in, the, in the same way, like when you see a film projected on the screen, you might, you might see how it behaves in the projector a little bit, especially if the film is, is shrunken or damaged. You might see the, the frame shake a little bit when there is a splice going through the projector. Um, and you'll learn about uh, you know, the color, the scratches, uh, other information that is conveyed to you by seeing the resulting image that is made by the combination of the film print and the projector. But the experience of working with the film print is very different if you have it on an inspection table and you can unwind the film, you can get your hands onto the edge, you can feel the edge damage, you can uh, know where you have to do repairs and treatment and cleaning. So in order to, and I found in order to be a very effective uh, film archivist, you need to be able to experience the object with both of these perspectives, to have it on a table or have it, the projection on a screen. Uh, but with, with, digital, with digital files, when they come to the archive, uh, I started to realize that as an archivist, I was mostly working with the projection, meaning that I would, I would take the digital file and I would see it in QuickTime Player or VLC or, or Final Cut Pro. I would see like the projected image that the, di the digital file makes, but I did not really know how to have the experience of having the film on a table. I mean, the digital file on a table so I could um, understand it more intimately. Uh, so with uh, film, you know, when you zoom into it, you can try to get to the more and more granular components as you go. So with this uh, film frame of this boy sitting in the grass, if you zoom in, you can start to see uh, the grain of the film. And then when you get in even closer, you can start to see the, the chemicals of the emulsional layer. Um, so with digital, uh, it's like this. When you go down to the bottom, you have uh, binary data. Uh, so this is binary data of like a, a black and white image. Uh, you're just seeing ones and zeros. So it's binary data is a, a form of numerical representation where you just have two numbers, zero and one. So when you count, it's like zero, one, 10, 11, 100, 101. Uh, so this is a representation of how data is stored in a in a object that holds digital information. 
So um, <clears throat> with film formats, such as 35 millimeter, 16, 8, um, the arrangement of the data on the film is easy to comprehend to the eye. Um, let's see. Let me go back. Oh, more ahead here. Yeah. Can't find what I want. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is uh, a picture of the edge of the film where the sound is, and just by looking at this, I can tell that there, okay, there are three kinds of sound. Uh, I can see two types of digital sound here and one type of analog sound, and then, uh, the, of course, the sprockets as well. <clears throat> also, by looking at the, the film print just in your hands, you can tell uh, some of the basic visual information, like is this a black and white film print or color? Uh, what kind of audio is there? Uh, for instance, like we have these kinds of audio in this picture. <clears throat> and then you can see other uh, types of metadata, like there are edge codes that tell what year the film was made. Uh, sometimes there are event triggers in a film print, like there'll be a piece of metal that when it goes through the projector, it will activate um, a mechanism to turn on the lights in the theater. So like at the end of the film print, there'll be this uh, device to turn the lights on because the film is over and people can go home. <clears throat> uh, beyond just looking at the film print, like you have, to, you have to know other information about it, like the speed at which it should be shown. Should it be shown at 24 frames per second or 18? Uh, such information is pretty essential to the presentation. Uh, also, by looking at the film, you get information about the aspect ratio, which is like the relationship of the width to the height. Like, is this a very wide fil Im film image or a, like a more old-fashioned, a more square uh, fil film image? Also, by looking at the film, you see the, the information about the frame size and the rotation of the image. Uh, for instance, with most 35 millimeter film, the, the pictures are presented horizontally, but like in an IMAX film, the, the frames are rotated uh, so they can sto be stored on more space of the film print. Uh, this is a bit analogous to like when you have a, a digital sensor in a camera, like in, in your iPhone, and in, you turn your iPhone like, like this. The, the sensor is, is in the same orientation, but your uh, camera is adding a piece of metadata to say the rotation is, is like this in the resulting data. And then also when you look at film, uh, a film print, you, you can infer some information about the aperture or the gating of it. Uh, because on the film print, you will see the, the sound, the sprockets, the image, uh, the boundary between the images and infer what part of it is supposed to be shown to the audience. Typically, the audience should not be able to see the audio in the image, but there will be uh, an aperture or gate to it. OK, so with digital information, all this kind of information is still there, but it is not as easily interpreted to the eye. So when I, when I had my first job uh, as an archivist, I worked at a news program called Democracy Now! in New York. And, uh, most of the collection used mini DV tape and DV cam tape. And this is a type of tape that is digital. Uh, so there's, there's a way where we can transfer the data from the tape into a file. And when you take that data and you align it by 80 byte blocks, it looks like this. Um, so at first I had no idea what I was, what I was looking at when I started to study the, the data in this way, uh, but it felt more analogous to like when you have a film on a bench and you're handling it and you're touching it and learning more about it in a precise way. Uh, so eventually I found the specification for DV and tried to study it and very slowly started to understand how the data is arranged. Uh, so, I mean, I won't go into too many details of this example, but uh, for instance, you can see the line, each line either starts with a one, three, five, seven, or nine. Uh, the lines that start with one are the equivalent of like the space between the frames on a film. It's the boundary uh, between one piece and another. Uh, the lines that start with three are holding the time code. Um, and often the time code is written many, many times because they want to make sure that when you have the tape playing in fast forward mode or rewind, it can still read the time code. Uh, the lines that start with seven contain the audio. Uh, so it's kind of the equivalent of seeing the audio going down the side of the film strip. And then all the lines that start with nine are the visual image. All of this information has to be subsequently decoded, but it's all there and it's arranged in a structure that I found very um, 
equivalent to, to how data is arranged and stored on film because it's very disciplined and regular. And a reader, which is either a, a DV player or a film projector, knows where the data is and how to use it. Uh, one thing I also realized is uh, DV, a point over here. Uh, in this column, you can see uh, the zeros going from the top to the bottom. I found in the specification that the zero is, uh, is a note if the DV player read the data correctly or not. So if it reads the data from the tape correctly, it makes a zero. But if it reads it incorrectly, it puts a, a note to say how it will hide the error. And I'll show a bit of an example of this later. <clears throat> so whether we're talking about film or, or videotape or, or digital uh, audiovisual files, uh, this is a list of the types of data that might be contained within that carrier. Uh, certainly when we talk about audiovisual files, we, we mean that it has video and audio inside it. Uh, but sometimes the files will also store images. Uh, for instance, if you download a video in like the, um, on like uh, the Apple TV store, it, you get a video that has uh, audio and video inside, but it'll also have like still images, like the poster art, like the still frame that will display in your catalog. Uh, similar to that with like an MP3 file, it might have an audio in it, but also an image of like the, the, the cover art of the album. Uh, other types of data that might be in these kinds of files or, or film or videotape would be captions and subtitles, uh, just additional text to help with uh, translation or access to people who are unable to hear. Uh, some of these types of audiovisual files might have more metadata or chapters to kind of arrange the time. Uh, sometimes, not so much, not so often, but they could have uh, haptics in it. Uh, audio, an audiovisual file that has a haptics information would be like used at um, like an amusement park where it's like, okay, we will show the video and then there will be a trigger that make like, okay, this, the seats will rumble now and then later the smoke machine turns on or the lights change. Um, or like it's kind of the equivalent of film to have a trigger to turn the lights on. It's when um, the audiovisual is trying to uh, trigger other things that the audience will feel. And then some types of audiovisual data will include attachments, like fonts to support the subtitle. And then, of course, uh, time code uh, can be within many of these formats as well. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an example of um, a damaged DV tape. So the mini DV tape is being read by the player. And uh, when I get the resulting file, I can see that there's some problems wrong with it. Um, you know, as this man moves, you can see part of the frame becomes stuck. Some of it is very glitchy. You see these colors that don't belong there. Uh, so as, as I was showing earlier, I, I eventually learned by using the specification that there is, this, um, there is this position where it's either a zero if the data is correct or something or a note um, to say how the error was hidden. And in some ways, like the DB player is like, um, doing a restoration when it reads the tape and there's a scratch and it cannot read the data, it will cover the data up by um, copying the part of the prior frame over the damaged frame. Uh, like this is kind of a feature that like a film projector doesn't have. If the film is scratched and there's a part missing from it, you just see the scratch. But like the DV player, what it's doing is it, it's, it recognizes that there's a scratch, that the data is wrong, and it tries to cover it up by using the prior frame. So from this, uh, when I started to understand this better, I could take data like this and do a copy paste to say, okay, if, it is, if the data is damaged, I want to show it as white instead. Uh, so this, this really helped for, you know, me understand the data in a different way because it became a lot more analogous to the kind of damage that you would have of a film frame. Uh, here you can see that there is like severe edge damage on the DV tape and uh, a scratch on the other side. Uh, you know, so then by arranging the frames vertically like this, you could see that there's this uh, kind of relationship in time from one frame to the other in a digital tape, and that's very similar to the way um, like film would get damaged. It's just you don't see it in the same way because in digital, often there's a mechanism to conceal or hide the errors. But like as preservationists, when we want to test the accuracy of our works to move data from tapes to files, 
it's important for us to know how substantial this, this uh, type of damage is. Okay, so I'm gonna go through um, a, some uh, of the vocabularies that are associated with uh, digital audiovisual formats. At the, at the highest level of the audiovisual file is the, the container format. Um, this is often represented by the extension of the file, like .mov, .mxf. Uh, so this is a list of the most uh, popular audiovisual containers, like QuickTime, Matroska, MXF, AVI. Uh, so these, a digital container is kind of like a box or a package. And when it's opened, you have the encoded data inside, which would be like, okay, inside is the video, the audio, maybe the time code, the subtitles. Um, but the container is really just like a box. It's supposed to hold the information and describe what it is. Uh, these charts are from like a study I did. Okay, the study is old in 2010, uh, but I was trying to study the popularity of formats over time because uh, some formats, they become very popular and then they go away quickly. Uh, you know, right now we use a lot of MP4, uh, MOV, uh, but as archivists, we always have to be prepared that the popularity of these formats will start to decline. You know, in the same way, like, videotapes uh, aren't used so much more, like, the same kind of rise and fall in popularity is happening to digital formats as well. And in a preservation environment, we have to be well prepared for that. So here I'm making an analogy to say that the container format is uh, kind of like a bottle, a can, a uh, coconut. <laughs> um, and that we require the right tool to open it. So you might have a piece of software that can read QuickTime and read MXF, but cannot read AVI. Um, you know, we have to have the right tool for the right file. It's, it's very difficult to have an audiovisual player that will support all formats because it's constantly a moving target. Uh, people are always innovating and improving upon audiovisual formats. And we, the people who develop the tools have to kind of strive to keep up and expand these tools. I already showed this slide, <laughs> sorry. So when you open the audiovisual container and you have the video inside, um, the video is uh, encoded in a, in a way. These encodings are kind of categorized by lossless or lossy. So in the lossless uh, category, we have uncompressed, where the video is, is just not, um, it's very simple, it's so like when you have an uncompressed uh, file, you might just, inside it would be like the red, green, blue value for a pixel, and then red, green, blue for the next one, and the data would be huge. For a, an hour-long video type, you might have a 100 gigabyte file if it is completely uncompressed. Uh, the other type of lossless uh, video encoding is compressed. Um, this is losslessly compressed. Two of the most popular encoding formats uh, for this are JPEG 2000 and FFV1. But in this case, if you took like that 100 gigabyte uncompressed file and you transcoded it using JPEG 2000, it might be like a third of the size. It, it uses, um, it tries to identify patterns uh, to reduce the amount of data it has to store. Uh, but much more common that we work with day to day is lossy formats such as uh, H.264, ProRes, DV, MPEG-2. These are compressed so that they're much, much smaller. Instead of 100 gigabytes, it might just be one. Uh, these are really fine-tuned to make the data as small as possible so that we can transmit it, so we can get it on our phones, even if our internet connection is not too good. So the lossless category is really associated with preservation, because when we digitize a videotape or, or a film, we want the resulting file to be as accurate as we can have it to the original object. Uh, whereas a lossy format sacrifices that accuracy for efficiency, so that we can... Um, move the file online so we can download it onto our phone. Like I cannot download a 100 gigabyte uh, video file onto my phone, but it's okay for me to get maybe 400 megabytes of a, of a movie of the same length. Uh, but in the same way, the encodings within the file rise and fall in popularity too. So uh, in the same study I was doing, it, it shows okay, like Real Video 3 was very popular in 2003 and then it is almost not seen anymore after that. Uh, similarly, like the video codec Sorensen 3, at one point uh, it was, this graph is showing the acquisition of video of the Internet Archive. So 
at one point near 2004, Sorensen 3 was very popular. It was like 40% of the acquisitions, but then it just declines and then it's almost gone. And then I don't know, somebody has like a little project for Dirac in like 2009, but otherwise it's a very rare codec to have. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So I want to talk a, a little bit about the, the differences between uncompressed video data and compressed because often archives have uh, very limited resources for uh, storing the resulting data of a digitization project. So <clears throat> when we store it as uncompressed, it's, it's bigger, uh, but it's, it's very accurate, it's very simple, whereas compressed it uses less data and it's um, more efficient but a little bit more complicated. Uh, so one of the differences is that a compressed video codec will typically contain uh, contextual information about itself and also checksums, metadata, and methods to support error resist resilience. Uh, for instance, if the data becomes damaged, it will contain some mechanisms to help it uh, conceal the damage. Whereas if uncompressed, it's very simple. It's just the, the pixels and the, uh, the, the pixel data and that's it. There's no context, there's no error resilience, no metadata, no checksums. In this case, the, the container, like the QuickTime file or MXF file, has to document everything about the file. <coughs> uh, one of the more noticeable um, aspects in, in a debate, like should the archive use uncompressed versus compressed for a preservation master, is the size. A compressed, losslessly compressed file will be about one third the size of uncompressed. Um, Lossy codecs reduce the data size much further by losing certain information. But on the other hand, uncompressed video codecs are, are huge. So if I have a, a collection of a thousand, uh, a thousand videotapes and I want to digitize, if, um, if I'm using uncompressed, I might need like 100,000 gigabytes of storage, which is expensive. If I use a losslessly compressed uh, codec, it might only be a one third of that size. So it's a difference in like how much e-waste we're creating, how much data storage we need, how slow it is to move the data. Uh, but a disadvantage for a lossy, losslessly compressed codec is that a small change to the data, like to change a one to a zero, might have a, a very large impact on the presentation. Instead of just affecting a few pixels, it might affect a whole frame and really distort the presentation. Whereas an uncompressed codec, if you change a one to a zero, it would change one pixel and that's it. The difference would be very, very minor. So often when archives are trying to decide like what types of formats to support, uh, lossy formats, lossless or uncompressed formats, they, they have to make some choices on if they, t if they are going to support that format as it is or if they are going to change it to a format that they like better. Uh, so for archives receiving digital material, I usually suggest this kind of decision making. Uh, first is like, does the archive already support this, this codec and this container? And if yes, then it's okay. We let the data in and we know how, what to do. But if no, we don't support it, then we should ask, okay, should we start? Um, if, if, if an archive is receiving audiovisual content in a format that it's not familiar with, and it wants to uh, start adding that support, then it needs to do the research, it has to gain tools and expertise. Uh, but sometimes there might be a case where it's like, okay, we decide we're taking this data in, but we don't like the format that it's in. So we don't want to start supporting that format. Instead, you know, we'll say no, and in that case, we'll do uh, bit level preservation, which is just, we'll keep the file as it is, but we will not really support it. And normalization, which would be like, we want to transfer that content to a format that we like better, that we do have control over. <coughs> Another detail I want to present about um, digital files is this concept of like interlace versus progressive. In a, in a progressive format, you see the entire frame at once. Um, but in an interlaced format, you see two pictures that are like zippered together. So this is showing a, um, a video where it transitions from one scene to the other. So on the left, you see uh, one picture and on the right, you see the, f the first picture of the next scene. But in the middle, it transitions from one scene to the other in the middle of a frame. So they are, two different pictures are like combined together, like they're zippered. You know, so it ends up looking like this. You see both images together. One is in the odd lines, one is in the even lines. This is a close up of it. 
Uh, another concept to know about digital video is uh, about video planes in color space. Um, some video will use uh, this format called RGB, red, green, blue. So for every pixel, it will document a red value, a green, and a blue value. Uh, but typically in video, you know, more, more commonly, we will see YUV. So uh, this is a picture that compares RGB and YUV. So on the left, you see the combined color picture. Uh, but on the right, you see the three individual pieces of that color space. So for red, green, and blue, uh, you, you, know, you see uh, red, green, and blue. And they are combined to make the, the whole picture on the left. On the bottom is YUV. Uh, and those three are combined in a different way to make the same image. The reason YUV is used is that it moves all the information about the brightness into one picture, the gray picture you have here, and then all the color is moved into the other two. And then once you, once you have this, um, sometimes they reduce the amount of data that's used for the color information because the theory is that the eye is more sensitive to brightness than to color. So if you divide brightness and color, you can um, use different strategies to, to store them or to allocate data to them. So this is an example of a, a YUV frame that's pulled into the pieces. So you have the big Y part of the frame that shows the black and white image. And then on the left, you have the two color frames. And you can see here that those color frames are about one quarter the size of the whole frame. This is the most popular way of storing a video frame. We have like Y and then two smaller U and V. Uh, so almost any video we see on the internet is using this. So for every pixel, you have brightness value, but only for every one out of every four pixels do you have a color value. And then this is, <laughs> this is the math equation to convert from YUV to RGB. Uh, this is kind of an essential equation um, in processing video, because even if we store the video as YUV, we have to present it as RGB. Because if you look like, closely at the, the monitor of a keyboard or in the projector, it's using uh, red, green, and blue sensors. Like all the methods we have for presenting are going to be based on red, green, and blue. <clears throat> uh, this slide is just showing like some uh, numerical values for red, green, and blue, and what they would equal in Y, U, and V. Uh, so it shows that there are some rounding errors when you do the conversion between the two color spaces, because sometimes in red, green, and blue, you will have two colors that are distinct, but when you convert to Y, U, and V, some mathematical rounding will make them the same. So it's kind of a lossy conversion, but an essential one. <clears throat> so this is a, a picture of a Umatic deck. This is a, a video player that was used in the 70s and 80s quite a bit. Uh, in the middle, you can see the, the big drum. Um, and it has two sets of wires going to the, to the sides of, of that drum. Uh, when the video tape is put inside, the tape is wrapped around the drum, and the drum will spin. And on the two sides of the drum is like a little reader. It looks like, um, it's very tiny, like the size of a poppy seed. But the reader will read the, the brightness information off the videotape and the color information off the videotape. And then separately, it will read all the information on the odd lines of the frame, and another reader will read the even lines of the frame. And then <clears throat> the data as it's written on the tape is kind of arranged in these long diagonal stripes. So when the tape is wrapped around the drum, the reader is, is making this kind of diagonal pattern as, it, as the tape is moving by. And then there will be a different reader for the audio and for the video. Uh, let's see. Ah, I forgot the next frame is not there. I might jump ahead to find a frame. I wanted to show you in just a moment. Uh, this one. <clears throat> so I wanted to show uh, this this clip. This is from a videotape that I digitized at work, and then we made accessible. And then people started to complain that oh, it doesn't look <laughs> it doesn't look very good. Something's wrong. Um, so when we started to examine it, um, the examination helped by using this software, open source software called QC Tools, which allowed us us to view it in a certain way. Um, so I was talking about the concept of interlacement, where you have two pictures zippered together like this to make a frame, and then you have like Y, U, and V. 
So when all that information is presented together, the error is impacting in the entire image. But when you dissect the image, uh, now I see instead of zippering the frames together, uh, they are on top of each other. So the odd lines are on the top and the even lines are on the bottom instead of being in order. And then on the left I have the Y information which displays brightness and then the smaller information for color, U and V, on the right. <clears throat> so when I look at this I can see that okay, the, the information on the even lines on the bottom is okay, it looks fine. The color information on both uh, the odd lines and even lines is okay, but the problem is really uh, only on the top left image which is depicting the, the brightness information of the odd lines. Now once we saw this, we know, okay, this is not likely an error on the tape itself because if the tape was scratched, everything would be impacted in the same random way. Um, so with this we were able to realize that the issue is not the, the videotape, but now I can go back to my out of order slides. So in this case, the error was, was because one of the readers on one side of the drum became so dirty and obstructed that it could not read the information any longer. So that little amount of dirt made it so the entire frame looked so bad because like one of the components was, was uh, covered. <clears throat> okay, so another aspect I wanted to talk about, about um, my experience in the education of audiovisual uh, preservation is this concept of a secret recipe versus community knowledge. Um, for instance, like when I was at school, uh, I became aware of like some digitization vendors that would say, okay, we can handle certain very types of damaged film, like shrunken film. We have a special recipe to make a treatment so that we can still copy the film okay. But you know, they, it was a company that wanted to make money, so it would say, okay, I don't want to share this information. This, so the community would see, okay, this, this company has a technique that works that really saves film in this particular condition, but they don't want to share it. Um, you know, which is kind of a secret recipe. It's okay, if we can pay, then we can benefit from this knowledge, but we are, we are kind of isolated from the knowledge itself. Whereas in community knowledge, if we find some discovery that helps us save our cinematic heritage, uh, you know, we share it. It's, it's a different way of associating value and knowledge. Um, I think in, in some cases, maybe this doesn't just apply to audiovisual preservation, but any field of expertise, uh, some people feel that the exclusiveness of their knowledge is associated with their professional value. So they might try to demonstrate that they have expertise, but not share it, you know? So they will reveal the hint, but not, um, not collaborate or not share their skills. Whereas, uh, the, you know, the other, the other idea is that, to say that the exclusiveness is not something that makes you professionally valuable, but like how you contribute to the field and how you encourage our collective knowledge to grow together. Like, how, to, to what extent can we provide knowledge that becomes a building block for other people that helps us all improve as a, as a professional field? <clears throat> so this, this issue is quite uh, serious of audiovisual preservation because we really face a crisis right now. Um, many audiovisual archives have hundreds of thousands of videotapes uh, in our collections, but the videotapes require players that are not made anymore. So if, you, if we want to save the content of these videotapes, we need to really preserve access to the, to the players themselves. So this is showing an eBay search for a Umatic player. Uh, the price is all over the place from 250 for two players to 2,000 for one player. And then when you read the descriptions, they're not very helpful. It'll say, okay, it seems like it's in good condition, but I don't know how to test this. Or it'll say, okay, I tested it by like turning it on and a tape went in and that's it. <laughs> Um, so for audiovisual archivists, like we have our tapes that are decaying, we have our, the hardware that we're dependent on it is becoming harder and harder to receive. Um, oh, and another story I can share is that I was going to buy uh, a film rewind set from a, a company in Manhattan. It was like the kind of thing you put on your table, you put the film on and then you can crank through the film. 
And when I went to buy it, he had two of these Umatic players at his company. And I said, okay, I want to buy the, the, the film rewind, but what about these Umatic players? And he said, oh, I'm going to recycle them tomorrow at the store. And I was like, can I please have them instead and use them? Because at work, we have like 7,000 uh, of these tapes. And because of that, we need to preserve enough health in the machines to transfer them. Um, so in, in one way, it's it's been a good time for archivists because the people who have these machines in the kind of companies that would create video, they don't want them anymore. If you see them and ask for it, they'll say, OK, this is junk to me. You can have it. But on the other hand, it's risky because so many of the places that have these players are throwing them away because they're valueless to them now. Uh, so for, for an archive that has so for an archive, it's very important to realize what formats you have in the collection and be able to pre preserve the ability to access them by going out and finding the players and collecting them and sharing them with those who need them. So whereas videotapes kind of present us with this crisis because we cannot make new players, we have to preserve these like 30, 40 year old players that still happen to exist. Uh, with digital files, it's, uh, it's a little bit different because we can make more copies. Like, we can't copy paste a Umatic player, but we can download VLC as many times as we want. Uh, so this is a, a tweet from Videoland, the organization making VLC, because when they were at this conference, they got to three billion downloads. And there is nowhere near three billion Umatic players or film projectors. Um, like when we tried to figure out how many film projectors or Umatic players we have, there is always just less and less and less because people are throwing them away. They are dying. We still have these videotape collections, but they are dependent on diminishing resources. OK, so this next concept I wanted uh, to present is the concept of, um, it's really about how we design a workflow within an audiovisual archive. Uh, so it's comparing these concepts of a microservice and a monolith. Uh, so I'll introduce it a bit on this slide. So. Um, um, a monolithic system would be uh, like when an archive is, is saying, okay, we, need, we have all this digital information, and there are many things we need to do with it. We need to catalog it. We need to uh, take our preservation video and make files to put on the internet. We need to do quality control testing. Um, we need to like make reviews. Uh, hang on, I got to sneeze, but it's not here yet. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> but when an archive realizes it has to do all these different types of functions of their digital content, they might say, okay, in order to meet our challenges, we want to get one big system that we will buy, and we will like move all our video content into this system, catalog it there, make derivatives, uh, do all of our work within the system. This is really like a monolith, and many, ar you know, many archives work like this because it, it works well. Um, some of the advantages is then you have this relationship with a company that develops the monolith. So if, you're, if you say, okay, it doesn't work, or I needed to do this, or can you help me understand how it works, you have this company you can rely on. Uh, with a microservice approach, it's very different. Instead of having a big system, you, you realize, okay, I have this big list of functions I want to do, and you make a little uh, workflow or program for each one of them. So, so like, this ends up being how I work in the public university where I'm at. We have a microservice-based system. So we receive all this audiovisual content in, and we say, okay, we, we need to make a podcast file of it. We need to make a DVD. Uh, we need to make a file to upload to YouTube. We need to make technical metadata reports and checksums. So for each function like this, we make a little computer program, you know, maybe a few dozen lines of code that, you, that coordinates open source tools to, to take the preservation file and do the function to make the access file or the checksum. Uh, so this approach requires us to, to do more computer programming ourselves, but it makes the process very flexible because we're not limited by what the monolithic system offers to us, but we, if we are creative enough and innovative enough, we can build what we want with the microservice system. <clears throat> uh, so I, I have this list of, of some considerations as to like when you would want to choose a microservice approach rather than a monolithic approach. And one of them is uh, when the staff of the archive has or is willing to acquire comprehensive technical knowledge of the objects involved, processes, and tools. Uh, so this is really what I felt 
in when I was studying film preservation at the at the archive when I was studying uh, that there was really a desire to know so much of the technical information about the film. We want to know everything about how it works, how the tools work, so we really have control over the full process. Sometimes when archivists have been transitioning to managing uh, digital content, like there's not as much of a desire because we can't see the data in the same way as the film. But it's, you know, it's still possible. Another, another consideration for microservice is when the design of the workflows has to be agile and responsive to serve target communities. Sometimes the way we work with our digital content has to change very quickly because uh, the communities we're serving will want a different type of file or now they will need some transcripts too or additional types of metadata. Um, when we have a very responsive relationship with the communities we serve, we might need to adapt how we serve that community very quickly. Um, if we have a monolithic system, it might slow our ability to change or evolve. Uh, whereas if we have microservice-based system, we can modify and replace the little pieces as we need. Also is uh, when the responsibility for the function maintenance and design of the function is appropriate to be on the archive staff rather than an outsourced company. And this is a really an issue of trust, you know? So like if my colleague says, okay, I will design this, this, uh, this program, that will make, um, I don't know, say like it makes um, a voice to text translation of the file. So I have a file and they make a program to make a, a transcript using the computer of the, the words of it. Like if I'm going to depend on this function, I have to say, okay, do I trust my colleague to make the script? Uh, do I trust them to fix it when it breaks? Um, that, that feeling of trust might be different if I'm hiring a company that has experience and that's their job to do this particular function. Uh, because then I can say, okay, I'm paying for support, I want this company to help me. Uh, so it's a bit different um, where the trust and the responsibility lies based on if we are making the tools ourselves or depending on a company. Another consideration is when the opportunity for a monolith is not worth the cost for a long-term investment, uh, such as when the work is managed in a temporary state or the evolution of technology is paced such that the archive must be prepared to examine and replace the tools on an ongoing basis. Um, so like when I think about this in, a, in an archive, I think that for an archive really, the, the, the most important thing is that we sustain our media objects and the information about them. We need to, the content that's in our film, in our files and videotapes, we need to preserve this. And we will use different systems in order to do that but the preservation of the system itself is not important. We will replace the systems as we need. You know, right now we might buy one system to catalog our files, but in five years it's gone and we get a new one. I'll skip this part. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the, the next concept I want to talk about with uh, managing digital content is about archival packages. Uh, this is from a standard called OAIS. Open Archive Information System, and it expresses a concept of standardizing three types of packages within an archive. Uh, one is the submission package, and that's defining how the archive is receiving the submission of data. When the videotapes or the files are coming in, we say, okay, this is the form in which we need to receive it. Uh, the next one is the archival information package, and this is how we take the content that is submitted to us and we arrange it in a way that we can uh, store it for a long time so that it is sustainable. And then finally is the dissemination information package. And that's how we take the, the parts of our package to make available to the public. So for instance, somebody might submit to us a, a ProRes file, but we want to disseminate like an MP4 file that we put online. <clears throat> so when this when this concept of packaging is put into place, it's kind of these three basic steps. We're making a folder structure to store the resulting files. We're creating uh, access copies like MP4s or MP3s, the checksums, the logs, and storing them all in a common structure. Uh, this, this allows us to have like one uh, digital object uh, for each, for each um, conceptual item that we have. Because often when you, when you have like one piece of uh, one digital item we're trying to preserve. In order to pres preserve that, we have to make many other files too, uh, like logs, reports, access files. So packaging allows us to store them all in one common structure as one uh, object. So with, uh, with videotape, this, common, this concept of a package exists too. 
uh, for instance, this is like this beta cam tape. Um, the the package is the you know the video audio video material on the tape itself, but also the label on it, the barcode, the associated cataloging record. Like it's it's all this conceptual package of the archival object. When it's digitized, it's just all in a folder instead of in a box, in a piece of paper, in a database. So this is a picture of the archive that I work at, and uh, we started to try to arrange our videotapes in such a way uh, that uh, optimized them for digitization. We, we assume that for the more majority of these videotapes, the next time the videotape is used is for the process of digitizing it. So uh, because of that, for each format, we, we stored them in separate boxes. So it's all like U Umatic, no, sorry, Betacam FX yellow tapes in this box. And then other, box, other tapes are different sizes, so they're in different types of boxes. But we did this because the way we digitize different types of tapes has little bits of difference. For instance, a Umatic tape is a, a two-channel stereo audio, whereas a DigiBeta has eight channels of audio. So when we're digitizing, we have to change our, our settings a little bit from tape to tape. So in order to make that easier, we group all the like tapes together. <clears throat> so when they are uh, digitized, we have the, the preservation master file, the checksums are made, the logs, the derivative files, and then that package of everything is moved onto an LTO tape. Uh, so these, these are the LTO tapes we work with. It's, um, it's like a little data tape, about half the size of a VHS tape. And uh, these ones, they all, they all hold a little over five terabytes. So when we're digitizing it, it really makes a, a kind of a startling difference that we start with maybe a few dozen boxes like this and then end up with a couple tapes. The reduction in size as we move the data from old formats to new formats is always going from bigger to little. Uh, you know, also this is kind of a, one of the advantages archivists have working with um, you know, digital formats for preservation is as, as we move audiovisual content from one object to another, in a digital realm, we're always going from many objects to less. So many of these tapes to fewer of these tapes. Whereas, uh, you know, a few decades ago when we're doing our preservation, it was more of a one-to-one -one copy. So if we have a film print, we're copying it onto one other film print or one videotape onto one newer videotape. But with digital formats, we're going from like many to less. So it kind of makes it easier for us every time we have to move the data. <clears throat> and then uh, this is a picture of where I work, one of the packages itself. So the, the highlighted file right there, the .mov file is the preservation master. Under that is a, is a folder called access, where it contains every access file format, like the DVD master, the MP3 podcast, a file to send to YouTube. And then at the top upper part, we have the metadata, which is like the checksums, technical metadata reports. Um, so when I go back to this concept of uh, archival packages, we have submission package, archival information package. In the application of this, that highlighted file is basically a very simple submission package. That's what uh, the creator of the file gave to us with a, a form to give the title and metadata. But for us, to hold that file alone isn't sufficient to hold it in, a, in an archive for a long term. We have to add all these other files to help support its accessibility, and we have to add this metadata to ensure that the file is the same over time. So we have, uh, we have archival packages. We have the submission archive and dissemination package. But for getting from the submission package to the archival package is the question mark. Like, what do we have to do to get from the single wave file, the single MOV file to everything else. <clears throat> so that's where really the, the concepts of microservices come in, because in order to in order to make each one of these files, we make like a little program that's going to read the preservation master and then create the, the resulting file. So most of these access files are made of FFmpeg, an open source tool. For the metadata reports at the top, they're used. They're they're coming out of uh, checksum tools or open source uh, technical metadata reporting tools like Media Info. So I want to show the the concept of archival packaging in a in a more familiar example, uh, showing it with YouTube. With uh, YouTube, it has this form for uploading video, 
And this is how it forces the submission package into the collection. So you are offered a very basic metadata form where you put in your title, description, your tags. And then you can put in, I think, a copyright license. You can say if it's public or private. And then you add one video file. So what the user is providing is very limited. They cannot add two video files to one, uh, one uh, submission package. Uh, they can't add more customized metadata. It's very constrained. But when, when YouTube is managing this, like managing their concept of the archival information package, they're adding a bunch of other information uh, to make sure that the content is usable uh, over, over time. So the processes they're adding is to like add automated captioning to, add, to extract the sound and try to convert it into text. They're also providing a mechanism for adding user reviews. Uh, they're doing content flagging to like identify like you know nudity or sex inappropriate materials. Uh, they're adding many different derivatives uh, to the uh, different sizes and formats. So even though you submit one one video file, uh, YouTube is then making maybe like 12 more files so that the video is accessible on like different type of mobile devices, different types of browsers, and uh, different for people of different types of um, internet data, like people who have very fast internet connections or very slow. They'll just like, get different qualities of their derivatives. Uh, YouTube also makes like the embed codes. Uh, they assess for audio watermarks, like to find out if there's like uh, copywritten music. And then they will say, OK, you have this like song in here and you're not supposed to. And then they track like uh, the view count statistics and technical metadata. So even though the user is providing a very simple submission, uh, the archival pa information package is very comprehensive, you know, and it, the, the comprehensiveness is intended to make sure that the content is serving the purpose it's supposed to, reaching the intended audience, and allows the, the archive, or the company in this case, to, to be able to use the material over a long period of time. So, uh, I want to talk about the first um, microservice I, <clears throat> I ever made, and this is when I was working with a big audio collection. Maybe not quite this big. This is a picture of a bunch of audio CDs being moved around for recycling. Um, <clears throat> but in this, in this job, it was like my first job out of film preservation school, I had uh, a big CD, audio CD collection, maybe 7,000, and I had to make a plan to move them from the disk into a file. because. Uh, the, the compact disks were getting old. They were rotting, losing the reflectivity. They don't last very long, so we have to move the content to someplace new. Uh, so in order, so I wrote out the plan to say, okay, for each one, I want to put an identifier on the CD. And then on a computer, I want to make a folder with that identifier. I'll put the CD in. I'll copy the, the audio data into the folder. And I'll, I'll name it in a particular way. I'll make MP3s. I'll make a log to say when I'm doing it and if it goes okay. Um, but like when I started to realize, okay, if I have to do this workflow 7,000 times, it's gonna make me crazy because it's so much rep repetitive work, putting in the same identifier for the file name, the folder name, the technical metadata report. Um, so I showed the whole workflow to the IT person I worked with and he wrote this tiny script. Uh, so I say it's my first microservice. Uh, but this was uh, this made a big impression on me because this was a very simple computer program, only 18 lines. And when I, when I run it, basically it would say, okay, what's the name of the CD? I would type in the identifier. And then the program would make the folder, rip the audio from the CD, name it. It would make the MP3s, make the checksum, make the report, and eject the CD. So for me as the user, it was like the mo as easy as it could be. I would just put the name. And then when the CD is done, I would put in the next one and the next name. So uh, by using some computer programming expertise, I could take a workflow that would be very menial for a, a person to do and completely separate out what the person should do versus what the computer should do. Uh, because I realized how much time this saved me, it really compelled me to use some of my time to learn to use technology to make my work more efficient. You know. Uh, so we, even though my education was, was specifically in film preservation, this experience showed me that I really need to also learn how to use, uh, use computers, use programming languages, use open source tools to make the audiovisual work more efficient that I'm doing. 
so, so now at my current work at the university, um, the microservice collection we, we use is a bit more substantial. So this is a picture of it in GitHub. Uh, we have different scripts called like make, make DVD, make lossless, make MP3, make PDF. Um, so these microservices will just be run on the packages to make the different derivatives that we need to automate a lot of our um, archival work and to make it more consistent. Um, yeah, so I mean, so at work, uh, sometimes other archivists are like, oh, what kind of archival system do you use? Like, what kind of monolith? And we're like, we don't have a system like this. Instead, we use a collection of microservices like this. And you can see, like, in the upper left, it says we have uh, 1,460 commits when I took this picture. And uh, that means that's how many changes we do to this, because we're always saying, OK, we have this new idea. We want to add this kind of frames, or we wanted to make an animated GIF of the file. So as we have ideas uh, of what we can do with our archival material, we can add, we can add new microservices. So it's a process that's, process that's kind of always evolving. <clears throat> so in an, in an archive, like working with digital content and using microservices, I usually suggest this as a starter kit. Like, one is that we need a process to to package our audiovisual content that's coming in, to take our files that um, somebody gave to us or that we got from a digitization project and put them into a folder structure uh, that's consistent. Uh, second is we need tools to make the technical metadata. So audiovisual collection, that would be tools like FFmpeg, MediaInfo, ExaTool. These are open source projects that like can look in an audiovisual file and then make a technical report to say, okay, this is the format, the frame size, uh, this is like what the audio is like. Uh, this kind of technical reporting is, is very important because whether an archive has like film or videotapes or digital files, we need to keep track of how many we have of what type. Because if we have like thousands of umatic tapes, we must keep uh, a umatic player. And similarly, if we have thousands of like ProRes files or H.264 files, we need to make sure that we maintain the player for that. Because if there becomes a point in time when it becomes too hard to maintain the player, then we need to move the content. And that's what it's like right now with Umatic tape from like the 70s and 80s. It's becoming such, so risky, uh, so difficult to keep the player running because it's so old and there's no, no replacements. Uh, so we have to move the content. Uh, the third one is to make derivatives because generally the data as the archive receives it is not very convenient to make accessible to the communities that we're trying to serve. So we need to make a copy that works for the internet, that works for a research room. Uh, <clears throat> fourth is to make a checksum. A checksum is like a little digital signature that we can uh, take the file and make the signature. And then later, if we try to run the same checksum, it should give the exact same value. If it doesn't, we would know that the file changed over time. <clears throat> so this, this is an important process to make sure that the content is the same uh, as we're preserving it and it's not uh, degrading. <clears throat> so f I want to uh, promote this resource as, as an example. Uh, this is in the EMEA open source GitHub community. It's, it's called Open Workflows. And this is documentation from other archives that uh, work with microservices. So they, um, you know, they're using open tools to, to make a, a workflow for the digital objects. And then they're sharing that documentation with the community. So like when you're, when you're in an archive trying to, uh, you know, develop a new policy for managing digital objects or trying to evolve how you are working, uh, this is a good resource because generally you can find an institution that works a little bit like yours and see more examples of how they work. Like generally the um, people working with audiovisual preservation, we face a lot of challenges using our limited resources to, to try to do something tremendous to sustain all this audiovisual content. And it's so much better when we work collaboratively with our field because we are not uh, competitors. We all face these challenges the same. So if we share our notes to show what we're doing, how we're learning, uh, it's really for the benefit of all of us. Uh, so <clears throat> also about open source tools, I want to point out that in a way, an open source tool isn't just a, a standalone object, but a building block for other projects. So in, in my work, uh, I'd say the most common building block I rely on is called FFmpeg. Uh, this is a tool for converting 
video or audio from one type to another, but it can also do like a lot of analysis. It can do decoding, playback, um, quality control. But like this, this tool contains these libraries that are very significant. Um, so the libraries I want to point out are the number two and three, libav codec and libav format. These are libraries that uh, give you the decoders uh, for different types of audiovisual formats and codecs. So this, these are the libraries that say uh, that will allow FFmpeg to like read a QuickTime file or AVI file or decode ProRes or H.264. Um, these libraries contain like hundreds of different decoders for all types of audiovisual formats. So I'd say it's very, it's a very significant library for audiovisual preservation because since this project is so ubiquitous and open. I'd say if, if your video file is supported by these libraries, then, it's, then the sustainability risk is lower because it gives you access to billions of players that can use that file. Um, so these libraries are not just in FFmpeg, but they're also used in like VLC and other projects. Like if you upload your video to YouTube, YouTube is using these libraries to convert your files. Probably most of the video we actually see in front of our eyes has been processed through these libraries that are just they're just open source libraries that are ubiquitous and incorporated into so many projects. Uh, so one of these, one open source project I worked on involved quality control. So it was to make this project called uh, QC Tools. Uh, I showed uh, a little bit of it earlier, but this is an open source project that is built on others. Uh, so it uses FFmpeg to decode the video and to, to show it back and to make different values. So in QC Tools, it's making a timeline and on that timeline, it's graphing different audiovisual characteristics, like the brightness, or how glitchy it is, how it changes over time. So it's intended to be a tool uh, that helps us, um, like when we digitize a videotape to a file, to review that file to see if our digitization work is accurate, or if we need to repeat it, or clean our deck. Um, so it also is the tool that like can dissect the playback of a video like this, so that we can see the video in a, a different way to help us understand uh, why it looks the way it does, and if we should re-digitize the tape, how the treatment should work. Uh, <clears throat> so an another topic I want to uh, go over here is audiovisual digitization software, because like audiovisual um, archivists certainly have a crisis where our tape is decaying, the players are less and less available, and we need to digitize. But at the same time, the software we use for digitizing is another problem. So I usually divide the types of digitization software into these uh, four categories. There's some software that is made specific for certain types of uh, tape. Like mini DV tape and DV cam tape has certain digitization software just for that format. Uh, <clears throat> the second category is probably the biggest. It's like editing and production software. So this would be tools like Final Cut Pro 7 and Adobe Premiere which can help us digitize tape. Uh, the third one would be software that comes with digitization hardware. So like when we buy uh, a card that we plug into our computer that converts the signal from our video player into a digital file, sometimes that hardware will come with uh, digitization software that helps us use it. And then the last category would be uh, open source projects. <coughs> to, so to show some examples of each category, uh, this is an example of like that yellow tape I was showing earlier, Betacam SX. It's a digital tape. It's about the same quality as a DVD. It's uh, like an MPEG-2 file written onto the tape. So because it's a digital file, I just want to take the data off the tape and move it to a file. But uh, this is very difficult to do. Uh, but there used to be the software uh, DNE 700. Uh, it existed like maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> And I was trying to find the software, but I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked Sony, and they don't have anything to say about it. Uh, this is software that like existed for a short time when that, pop that tape was popular, uh, but now it's not available. So I have to find a different way to transfer it. Uh, another type of software that's made for a specific type of tape was for DV. So this is a website for DV Grab, which uh, let you take your DV player, plug it by FireWire cable into your computer, and then you would run the software and it would take the data from the tape to your file. Uh, but back in 2005, they say, okay, this is now a dead project because people are not using mini DV anymore. 
Uh, so the people who are recording to MiniDB, they are gone because now they have new cameras. They don't need MiniDB anymore. But for Archivist, we still have MiniDB and we need to transfer it. But now the software uh, project is dead. Uh, the source code is still available, but there's just no support, no more development. Uh, and, and right now, the website is gone. So I had to go to the Internet Archive to see what the website used to look like. In my, in my first job, when we had so many DV, this was the main software I used for digitizing DV tape called Live Capture Plus. Uh, it was really good because I could put the tape in and say to the software, okay, I want to digitize the whole tape, and it would rewind the tape, capture all the data. Uh, but a few years ago, they, they start to say, okay, this is a legacy project. We will not support it anymore, uh, but you can still buy it. Like we'll, They say, we will take your money, but we will not help you with this software. Um, when they do that, I got on Twitter and I said, okay, I see what you're doing, but I appreciate your work in the software, it's good, would you please consider open sourcing it? So like, even though you're not caring for it, uh, somebody else could care for the project. Uh, so some other people on Twitter were like, yes, that's great, please consider this idea. Uh, the company did reply to me, but only to say, okay, give us lots of money and we will keep developing the software. But um, I was like, no, that's not what I want you to do. I want you to make it so everybody can maintain the software, not just you. Uh, and then a few months after that, they took they took the website down, so the software is uh, just gone altogether. Uh, the, the category of like editing and production software, many of us used to use Final Cut 7 to digitize tape using this uh, login capture interface. Um, but then a few years ago, you know there's Final Cut X, and Apple rewrites uh, all their media tools so that they leave the old versions behind and they make from scratch new audiovisual tools like Final Cut X. So when they are doing that, they abandon many of the features. Uh, so like Final Cut 7 could digitize videotape, but Final Cut X, they are like, okay, we don't need to do this anymore because nobody's, nobody's making content in tape, even though archivists still need to digitize. Uh, so this was in like a, a newspaper review of Final Cut 7. It says, okay, uh, Final Cut X cannot output to tape. Videotape is on the way out, so you'd be hard pressed to even find a camcorder that takes tape anyway, so it's not in Final Cut X. This is one of several ways that Final Cut X is clearly a program designed more for the future than for the past. Uh, so I found this quote very instigating because I think as archivists, we need software that is designed for the past uh, because we have all this videotape that we still need to digitize, but the companies that used to make the tools are abandoning us. Uh, <clears throat> the other category I mentioned was software that comes with hardware. Um, so like when you buy a Blackmagic uh, video digitization card to convert from the, the videotape player to the computer. They give you software like this. So this is Media Express that helps uh, digitize tape. It's very simple. Uh, so you have very few options in how you digitize. It's kind of a proof of concept as to what the hardware can do. So it could it can be used to digitize, uh, but it's not like you get you get so few options. It makes it kind of hard to fit this into a preservation workflow. Uh, but but the Black Magic Company, one thing they do that I really like is that they release a software development kit for developers. This is code that allows uh, people in the open source community to develop tools to connect the Black Magic di digitization card to um, you know two different open source programs. So <clears throat> with that, we some people were able to develop uh, V-Record, which is a new software digitization, to, I mean, a new video digitization tool using open source software uh, that is made by people from the archival community. So we can put in the tape, we see different representations of the brightness and color data, um, some different values that let us know how the tape is doing, and this lets us digitize tape using open source tools. So this is, uh, this is really a good example of how open source tools are used like building blocks because vRecord is based on all these open source projects like FFmpeg, MPV, QC Tools, Kause. All these different open source tools are combined to make a new one in this digitization software. <clears throat> also, uh, because like whereas in Final Cut 7, it's a digitiza digitization tool, but it's not made for archivists, it's made for creators. With vRecord, because archivists are creating it for ourselves, we can add in things that are relevant to us. So for instance, in vRecord, 
uh, we make this cow say when there is a problem with the digitization. So here it's saying that the tape has uh, strange color issues. <coughs> I was trying to sneeze for like 15 minutes. It finally came. Uh, some more pictures of beaver coils. <coughs> okay. Now I'm going to transition from the topic of open source to open formats. Um, when we're when we're digitizing film or videotape, we have to decide, okay, what type of file are we going to make? Um, so some of the options we generally have are to make like an uncompressed file or ProRes, H.264. Um, I've been starting to work with this video codec called FFB1, which is a, a lossless audiovisual format. Um, so we can receive the data from the tape and we can store it in a compressed way, but without any loss to the detail. Uh, here's a bit of a timeline of FFB1. It was made in 2003 as part of the FFmpeg project. And then uh, later in 2009, the preservation community uh, really became involved and started to add more features, to do documentation. Um, there was uh, a standardization project that started in 2016 with the Internet Engineering Task Force to standardize the document. Um, but I find in a, in a lot of cases, uh, audiovisual archivists have to receive formats, but don't necessarily have a much of a voice in how those formats are designed. But this is a case where audiovisual archivists are working directly with the, the people who are designing and documenting the format uh, to begin with. So it's, it's been a very encouraging project because for those of us concerned about how a file is suitable for preservation, we are directly involved with the process of defining the format. <clears throat> so I first learned about FFB1 from uh, this, this Russian study in 2007 that compared lossless audiovisual codecs. So it, it used many different audiovisual formats that were lossless and it would say like the speed at which it runs and the size of the data. Uh, so FFB1 was, was part of this and because of, because of this is where many archivists started to become more interested in it. Uh, let's see, this, this slide kind of compares FFB1 to another lossless codec called JPEG2000, uh, which, which is also very popular in um, in preservation, like well used by the Library of Congress and some other large archives in the United States. Uh, but in many ways, it's a much slower format than FFB1. Because JPEG 2000, I think, is mostly made for still images, where the speed of how fast it is is not really as significant as with video formats, where you have to have like 25 frames per second. Uh, FFB1 as a lossless video codec, there's kind of three big issues here. One is the losslessness of it. If you if you put audiovisual data into it, uh, you will get the exact same audiovisual data back out when it's decoded uh, without loss. Uh, the second one is is fixity. Uh, as a format, it will contain checksums within it. Uh, so if you have an FFB1 file, it is able to say itself it, if it is the same or if it has been damaged over time. Additionally, uh, FFB1 is very self-descriptive, so it will say its own aspect ratio, interlacement. It has a lot to say about itself. But then the last one is size. Uh, if you have an uncompressed file and then you change it to a lossless FFB1 file, it will be about a third the size. So that means the file is faster to move, requires fewer hard drives, less e-waste, uh, you know, greater efficiency. <coughs> So I'm going to show uh, some examples of, of the kind of damage that can happen to digital video. Uh, this was in an uncompressed recording that was moved over a network, um, like uploaded from a computer to a server. But when it was being moved, there was a network error. And in this place in the frame, it inserted a bunch of uh, zeros in this place. <clears throat> so whereas like a film will be, be scratched or shrunken or decay, like digital damage often looks something like this. Uh, let me skip these frames a little bit. With a, a lossless file, a little bit of damage will uh, impact a larger percentage of the frame. So this is an FFB1 frame. Uh, the frame is divided into six slices. And we can so we can see one sixth of the frame is wrong. It just has like this kind of psychedelic rainbow here uh, to depict the damage. With FFB1, typically, because it contains checksums, the decoder will know that the damage is there and it will hide it by covering it with part of the prior frame. 
Uh, but in this case, I disabled the feature so I could show what the damage looked like directly. <clears throat> so uh, one open standards organization is the Internet Engineering Task Force. They standardize how the internet works, so our email works and our websites. Um, they started a working group to focus on audiovisual formats. Um, so our working group is called Seller uh, for codec encoding for lossless archiving and real-time transmission. Uh, we thought the nickname Seller was very efficient because so many archivists work in the cellar, like Henry here, you know, downstairs. Um, but in this project, we standardize audiovisual formats like Matroska, FFV1, and FLAC. Uh, yeah, so this is the documentation coming out of that working group for the, the formats that I just referenced. And it's been really good to involve so many people in the audiovisual preservation community, with those who design audiovisual formats. Uh, we do our work in, in GitHub, which allows us to have a very public conversation about all the issues. So people can add in the request, they can say what bugs are in the documentation, and we can all work on it together. So it's been a very collaborative and uh, busy work to develop these, these formats. And now I'll say thank you, and then make Henry <laughs> facilitate some questions. But thanks for bearing with me for all of this. Alcaldía de Bogotá.